morning, Lycoming Valley Baptist Church. Thank you for uh, joining me for another week of virtual church. And as we do each week, you should know by now, we, we gather together to exalt Jesus Christ. And, and we're going to do that now by looking to his word. So if you have a copy of God's word, uh, I encourage you to uh, pick it up and open it up with me to Psalm 134. Psalm 134. And as you're finding Psalm 134 in your Bibles, let me welcome you to uh, message number two in our final lesson in our Psalm of Ascent series that I've entitled Worship 101. Uh, Worship 101. And again, that's exactly why we've gathered this morning. We're, we're here to worship Jesus. And in Psalm 134, the psalmist gets us, gets us to the heart of worship. He shows us how God desires to be worshipped, and he does so by giving us five facts about worship. And again, these facts have nothing to do with preferences, such as hymns or choruses, or praise bands or choirs, or powerpoints or, or hymnals. You see, the psalmist doesn't get caught up in that silly debate. He doesn't focus on the minors, but he focuses on the majors. You see... The facts he gives us show us the what, the who, the when, the where, and the how of worship. And last week we focused all of our attention on the first two facts, the what and the who. And this morning, Psalm 134 will once again be our sheet music. And together we're going to uncover the final facts about worship. And so if you're ready to dive back into the simple song and, and learn how to better worship Jesus Christ, then you know what to do. Lift up your voices and let's say go. All right, let's get going. Let's begin with this. Here is worship fact number three, the when. Uh, the when. When do I worship? Is worship a, a Sunday morning only thing? Is it a a convenient thing? I mean, do I worship only when I feel like it? I mean, when am I to worship? Well, thankfully, the psalmist doesn't leave us in the dark. He, his lyrics give us the answer, and, and it should be obvious. But look at verse 1 of Psalm 134. He writes, Behold and, and bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who by what night stand in the house of the Lord. Okay, so underline the words night and stand. Night and stand. Those are important. Uh, who here has ever uh, watched an episode of Blue's Clues? You remember Blue's Clues? My kids loved Blue's Clues. Well, the psalmist gives us Blue's Clues here. These two words, night and stand, give us clues into when we're to worship the Lord. You see, these two words were part of the job description of every temple sentinel. Way back in Numbers chapter 3, we see God choosing the tribe of Levi to be his ministers. He, he appoints them to temple service. And God split the Levites into three main groups. And each group had their own set of jobs, their own responsibilities. And, and one of those jobs... Was, was temple sentinels. Now, sentinels were not priests. Their, their job wasn't to offer uh, sacrifices. Uh, sentinels were not custodians. Their role wasn't to clean the temple grounds. Sentinels were not even musicians or, or members of the temple choir. You see, sentinels were, were watchmen. They were the original security guards. They were like uh, the, the mall cops of the temple. And their job was simple, guard the temple. And they worked in shifts. Some worked first shift, others, others second. Some were even willing to take the third shift. You see, sentinels were always on duty. And even though their job was far from glamorous and their work often went unnoticed, sentinels were always present, always there, standing guard, serving the Lord faithfully. That's the key word, because that's exactly how we're to worship. We're to be sentinels, always on duty, humbly worshiping the Lord day and night. So this means that worship is not just a Sunday morning thing. 
It's not a convenience thing. It's not even a, a feeling thing. Instead, worship is to be an every moment kind of thing. Like sentinels in the temple, our worship is to be faithful. You see, that's what God desires in our worship, humility. He wants us to be faithful. 1 Corinthians 4, 2 says, it, it's required of God's stewards, his servants, that they be found faithful. That word faithful means being constant in the performance of a duty. It means I don't give up, I don't, I don't shut down, I just keep on doing the thing that God has called me to do, like a sentinel, like a sentinel. Like sentinels were to worship God faithfully. Well, well how? I mean, what does this kind of faithful worship really even look like? Well, can you guess what's coming next? That's right, a what? A list. By now you should know that I, I love lists, and so here's a little list just for you. Are you ready? Here are two ways you and I can and must worship faithfully. All right? Two ways you and I can and must worship faithfully. Here's the first way. I must worship the Lord even when I'm busy. I must worship the Lord even when I'm busy. Listen, a busy schedule does not excuse you from worship. And yet, sadly, that is the number one excuse Christians give for not worshiping. I'm just too busy. Uh, jot this down if you're taking notes. Uh, busyness is the enemy of faithfulness. Uh, busyness is the enemy of of, of faithfulness. And trust me, that excuse, I'm too busy, will not fly with Jesus because Jesus shows us that even when we're busy, we're still to worship. Matter of fact, just, just listen to what we read in Luke chapter 5. In verse 15, it says this, the news about Jesus spread all the more and great crowds came to hear him and to be healed of their sickness. Okay, so it's pretty clear. Uh, Jesus was busy. He, he was not just pretty busy. He was really busy. And that verse proves it. You see, Jesus' time on earth was limited. His, his calendar was loaded. He was constantly bombarded with ministry opportunities. And yet, just, just notice what he intentionally set aside time for. Listen to these words in Luke 5.16. Yet Jesus frequently withdrew to the wilderness to pray, to pray. Guys, that's, that's worship. You see, Jesus is showing us this. Our worship shouldn't fit around our schedules, but our schedules should fit around our worship. Our worship shouldn't fit around our schedules. Our schedules should be fit around our worship. Even when busy and weighed down with responsibility, Jesus didn't excuse himself from worship, and neither can we. But oftentimes, don't we? We are so quick to say on Sunday mornings, I'm just, I'm just too busy. You see, if you want to be a sentinel who worships the Lord faithfully, then, then, then you have to ditch the excuse, I'm too busy. Here's the second way you can and must worship the Lord faithfully. I must worship even when I'm breaking. Even when I'm breaking, even when my heart is hurting, I must worship. Hurt is a fact of life. No one is exempt from hurt. As the band REM says, sometimes everybody hurts. And when you hurt, when your life just seems to be at its darkest, that is when your praise to God must be at its loudest. And this choice to worship even when you're hurting is what the Bible calls sacrificial worship. I mean, let's just be honest. Normally on most sunny days, it's, it's easy to worship the Lord, right? It's easy to give thanks. But what about when times are tough? When it's not easy, when, when your heart is broken, then it's an actual sacrifice, right? And no one knew this kind of sacrificial worship better than Job. Do you remember Job's story? 
His story is found in the book of Job. And in Job chapter 1, we see Job having a really, really, really bad day. Matter of fact, Alexander in the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day doesn't hold a candle the kind of day Job was having. In just one day, Job lost everything. Everything, everything dear to him. He lost his entire livelihood, all of his livestock, all of his savings, his 401k, all gone. It vanished. And when it rains, it what? It pours. On that same day, Job lost something even more precious, his entire family, his kids, his grandkids, all gone. They died tragically. And so clearly his heart was hurting. He was on the verge of breaking. And yet listen to what he says at the end of Job chapter 1. It says this, At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised be praised. That's that sacrificial worship. You see, Job is showing us this truth. You're going to want to jot this down. This is big time. Listen, praise helps me trust God's plan for my pain. Praise, it helps me trust God's, God's plan for my pain. Some of you, God brought you to watch this video for that very truth. God works all things for the good. Now, that doesn't mean that, that nothing bad will ever happen, but it does mean that God is so good, he can even use the bad pain for our good. And God had a good purpose for Job's pain. And even though God never revealed it, and even though Job didn't always see it or feel it, he believed it, he believed it. How? Worship. Worship. Praising God in his pain helped him to continue to trust God's purpose for his pain. The Lord gives and he takes away. I don't know why. I have no clue what he's up to, but I know this. He's up to something. This isn't meaningless. He's in control. He has a purpose. He does all things right and good. So this has to be for my good. And even though I can't see it, and even though I don't feel it, I believe it. Blessed be the name of the Lord. May the name of the Lord be praised. You see, loved ones, every unexpected darkness, every difficult circumstance, every devastating disappointment, every season of suffering in our lives are never meaningless. They always have a purpose. As Paul says, for our light and momentary affliction and troubles are working for us an exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So, so you see, every season of your pain from the fallen nature, every millisecond of your misery in the path of obedience is producing a peculiar glory that you will get from that whether it was criticism or cancer, whether it was sickness or slander, it wasn't meaningless. It's doing something. And of course, like Job, you can't see what God is doing. We don't, we, but we don't look to what is seen, but what is unseen. So when your dad dies, when when your child dies, when your spouse betrays you, when you got cancer at 30, don't say it's meaningless. It's not. It's working for you an eternal weight of glory. Listen, pain, suffering in the life of a believer is, is like a God at work sign. He's at work, even in our pain. He's growing us. He's shaping us. He's softening us. Pain pushes us to Jesus. Pain prunes us to look more like Jesus. Our pain is able to point others 
to Jesus, God has a purpose, a good purpose for every pain, and worship helps us trust the process. So when do I worship? The answer, every day, all day. Anytime, all the time. On good days and even on bad days. When, when times are busy and when times are slow, that's the time to worship. That's the when. And here's the where. That's worship fact number four. Where do I worship? Is worship only done inside? Do I worship only in a sanctuary? I mean, isn't that why we call churches places of worship? I mean, where am I to worship? Well, the psalmist points us in the right direction. Look at verse 1 again. Behold and bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who by night stand in the where? What does it say? The house of the Lord. Look at verse 2. Lift up your hands in the where? The sanctuary and bless the Lord. Okay, so once again, like an episode from Blue's Clues, the psalmist clues us in to where I'm to worship. Underline the words, house of the Lord and sanctuary. Do you see those there? These two locations refer to the same destination, the temple of God, located in the city of God, Jerusalem. Have you ever watched an episode of, of a show called House Hunters? Have you ever seen that? I love that show, and I, and I love that show because I love walking through and looking at the layout of, of different homes. It's just fascinating to me. And so real quickly, let me take you on a, a tour, a walkthrough of the house of the Lord. Are you ready? Now, the temple in Jerusalem was laid out in four main sections, four main sections. The first, it was the outer courts, the outer courts. This area was open to everyone and to anyone. Then there were the inner courts, which only the, the Jews were allowed entrance. Then came the, the holy place, which only the priests and Levites could access. And finally, there was the holy of holies. This is where God's glory dwelt. And, and only the high priest could enter here, but only once a year. And what separated the holy of holies, God's glory, from the rest of the house was a large veil or, or curtain. It was like a, a keep out sign. It was a barrier that said this far and no further. Now understand, this was not your typical window dressing. You, you can't pick one of these up at Bed Bath & Beyond. Trust me, it wouldn't even fit on the shelves. You see, this, this curtain was 30 feet wide. It stood 30 feet tall. It was five inches thick and weighed close to six tons. And get this, it took over 300 priests to carry it and to hang it in its place. Just imagine the wall anchors that were used to keep that in space. And this veil was hung not to block out the sun, but something much brighter and far more dangerous, the glory of God. God is a consuming fire. He is holy, holy, holy. He dwells in unapproachable light. And it was this heavy veil that kept sinful men from being completely consumed by the holiness of God. So you see, worshipers couldn't just come into the temple, find a seat in the Holy of Holies, and worship God. Not if they wanted to live. Well, why? Sin. Sin. Sin separates us from a holy God. It what, it's what keeps us from being able to stand in the presence of God. You see, sin was the problem. And though God did not cause the problem, he did provide the solution. You see, here's where the gospel comes in. Here's where this little song sings and shouts of Jesus. You see, we couldn't come before God. We couldn't enter into his presence, so God chose to come to us in the person of Jesus. Jesus came and, and died for that barrier, sin, and he did so on a cross. So that barrier could be broken and the holies of holies could be opened. 
You see, when Jesus exhaled his final breath and gave up his spirit in death, that 30-foot tall, 30-foot wide, five-inch thick, six-ton curtain was torn in two from top to bottom, all in a matter of seconds. The Holy of Holies was now open. Well, how? God tore the veil. Why? Because Jesus paid for sin once and for all. His sacrifice pleased the Lord. And because Jesus stood for us in death sacrificially, we can now stand before the Lord blamelessly. As the writer of Hebrews says, we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. So you see, it's only because Jesus willingly entered our world and offered up his life as a sacrifice for our sin that we are able to enter the courts of the Lord forgiven and offer up a sacrifice of praise. And here's the, the million dollar question. What must you do to be forgiven? Believe. You have to believe. Listen, forgiveness cannot be earned by good works or achieved with good gifts. You can't be moral enough. You, you can't be religious enough. It doesn't matter how religious and, and devoted you are. You see, forgiveness is a gift. And like all gifts, it must be received. And we receive it by faith. By faith. You must repent of your sin and believe in the sacrifice Jesus made for your sin. As Acts 10.43 says, everyone who believes in Jesus receives forgiveness of sins in his name. And when you choose to turn from your sin and trust in Jesus, all your sins are forgiven. His holiness becomes yours, and you stand blameless before the Lord. And so let me ask you, where do you stand with God? What's your standing? Are you forgiven, faultless, or are you still fallen and helpless? Have you confessed your sin and called on Jesus for forgiveness and grace? If not, today could be your opportunity. Now is the time because another opportunity may never come. But listen, if you have done that, Jesus is your holiness. You are blameless before God. Matter of fact, thanks to Jesus, you are now the temple of God. God dwells in you. How awesome is that? 1 Corinthians 9, 16 says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? You see, when, when you trust in Jesus, God not only forgives you, he also fills you with his spirit, making you his temple, which means you can worship the Lord wherever you go as you go. So I have to ask you, are you living that way? Is it obvious to others that you are the temple of the living God? You see, whether you are home alone or gathered with friends, whether you're at your desk working or in church singing, whether you're buying groceries or at the gym exercising, that can be a place of worship. Whether you eat or drink, or whenever you do, do it all for the glory of who? Of God. You see, that's the where of worship. Well, five worship facts. Four down, which leaves how many more to go? That's right, just one more. And here it is. I saved the best for last, the how. How? How do, how do I worship? I mean, I know I'm supposed to worship the Lord, but how do I worship him? Well, the psalmist shows us how, but his answer may surprise you. You see, his answer has nothing to do with how we sing, but everything to do with how we live. You see, worship is so much more than just lip service. It's life service. Jot this down. Worship is not just vocal, 
It's to be a lifestyle. Worship is not just vocal. It's a, it's a lifestyle. And, and notice this life of worship in these lyrics. Verse 2. Lift up your what? Your hands in the sanctuary. And then what? Then bless the Lord. Underline the words, lift up your hands and bless. Those words are our final blues clues. That word bless means to ascribe worth. It means to praise. And, and this is what we do with our lips, right? With our words, with our songs. And, and that's easy to do. But notice what must come first. Lift up your what? Your hands. You see, that is what we do with our lives. You see, worship, it's not just words. It also involves our walk. Now understand, lift up your hands is not talking about uh, silly hand signals or, or hand raising in worship. It has nothing to do with our hands, but everything to do with our hearts. You see, lifting up hands to God was a, a posture. It was a posture that symbolized clean hands and a pure heart, a holy life before God. You see, worship is not just singing holy, holy, holy. It's living holy. Worship involves both. It's not just vocal. It's to be a lifestyle. But here's the deal. Listen, if you're not living holy, then you can sing all the songs you want. But trust me, they will not please God. Because holy living is the highest form of worship. As Paul says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Now listen, this is your true and proper worship. You see, true worship that pleases God is holy living. Lifting up clean hands from a pure heart. As Psalms 24, 3 and 4 says, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place in worship? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. But you see, there's a problem. But there's a big problem. And the problem isn't God and his standard of holiness. The problem is us, right? We miss the mark. None of us this morning were born holy. We, we did not come into this world with clean hands and, and pure hearts. Jeremiah 17 says that our hearts are deceitfully wicked above all else and desperately corrupt. That doesn't sound pure. Psalms 51 says we were sinful from birth, filled with iniquity from the time we were conceived. That doesn't sound holy. Psalms 14 says there is no one righteous, not even one. That doesn't sound clean. Romans 3 tells us that we, were, we have all sinned. So you see, no one can ascend God's holy hill. No one can stand in God's holy place in worship. Why? Because no one has clean hands and a pure heart. That's a big problem. That's a big problem. But again, God provided the solution. You see, you and I could never meet God's standard of holiness. I mean, no matter how hard we tried, we just couldn't do it. But Jesus came and met it for us. Jesus lived the life we couldn't, a perfect one. He willingly clothed himself with our sin and offered up his life as a pleasing sacrifice to God so that sinners like us could be cleansed from sin, clothed in his righteousness, and therefore be fully pleasing to God. Now listen, we are cleansed and clothed with his righteousness only when we turn from our sin and trust in him. So I just have to ask you, have your hands been cleansed by the blood of Jesus? Has your heart been made pure by the sacrifice of Christ? Is Jesus your holiness? 
If so, then trust me, it will show. It will be obvious. You see, a clear evidence that you've been made holy in your position in the sight of God is you will strive to be holy now in your practice. Your desire will be to be what God sees, holy, blameless, like Jesus. You see, because Jesus gave his all to give you a pure heart, you will now give your all to walk upright. Because Jesus spilled his blood to cleanse your hands from sin, you will now desire to keep your hands clean. Now, are you perfect? Absolutely not. But you are progressing. Holiness is increasing in your life. When you do sin, you confess it. You make it right. You see, it's obvious. Think of it this way. Uh, did you have chores growing up? I sure did. As a matter of fact, every Saturday, uh, before I could do anything, I had to first do three things. I had to clean the windows, sweep the porch, and clean my room. Those were my chores. And, and let me ask you, can you tell the difference between a clean window from a dirty one? <laughs> yeah, it, it's obvious. Let me ask you this. Can you tell the difference between a clean porch from a dirty one? Yeah, it's, it's obvious. All you moms and dads watching this morning, can you tell the difference between a clean bedroom from a dirty one? Absolutely. Again, it's obvious. It's clear. And the same is true when it comes to clean hands and a pure heart. If your hands and heart have been cleansed from sin by the blood of Jesus, you can tell. You can tell. It's just obvious. It shows in a life of obedience. And you see, that's what God desires most. As God says, obedience is better than sacrifice. You see, worship is not just observing services and, and singing songs. It's not just blessing the Lord. It's obedience to God. And that's why the psalmist says, lift up your hands to God first. Live a holy life. Be holy. Then lift up your voices. Then bless. Psalm 119.7 says it best. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. You see, that's worship. That's the kind of worship that honors God. And it's not just vocal. It's a lifestyle. Well, well, notice how this little song ends. Look at that final verse with me. I love this final verse. Verse 3. The Lord of heaven and earth, what does it say? Bless you from Zion. So you see, loved ones, we are able to bless the Lord only because he first blessed us. Listen, the only reason why we can praise God and it blesses him is because Jesus first blessed us with his righteousness. Our worship this morning is only pleasing to God because Jesus first made us pleasing before God. And those who have been blessed by the Lord, those who have been blessed with clean hands and a pure heart through the blood of Jesus, they love to bless the Lord. They worship Jesus, who cleansed them and clothed them, and they do so not just with their lips, but more importantly, with their lives. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. God, we, we thank you for the time we've had the last two weeks to look at this simple song, just three simple verses, and yet, God, we, we were able to find five incredible facts about worship. You showed us exactly how you desire to be worshipped. And, and as we learn today, thanks to Jesus, it can be anywhere and everywhere. Thanks to Jesus, God, we can worship you anytime. In good days and in bad days, when we're busy and, and when times are slow. And then thanks to Jesus, God, we can, uh, our songs are pleasing to you because you made us pleasing. Jesus has made us pleasing. He, 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 his righteousness is now ours when we put our faith in him. And so, God, we want all the praise and all the glory to be to him. 
I ask this all in his name. 